it to the iron and put that into the system. So what's going to happen if I attach a piece of magnesium which is in the circuit with the iron? Then what's going to happen is the magnesium is going to corrode. Uh, you can do some really complicated simultaneous equation solutions and show that there's going to be some corrosion of the iron, but it's going to be very slight. Virtually all that's going to happen is this aluminum is going to corrode away. And um, uh, so the sacrificial anode protects the thing that you want to protect. The problem with the sacrificial anode, of course, or a potential problem, is that it does have to be in both electrical and uh, chemical contact. It has to be in the circuit if it's going to protect. I remember, gosh, when I was a graduate student, I didn't work on corrosion, but I happened to share an office with some people who were working on corrosion, and they had all these very interesting consulting problems I got involved in. This was in Boston area, and I recall one of them going out and looking at this guy who had spent all this money to get magnesium electrodes in his ship, and the ship was corroding away anyway, and he couldn't understand what problem we'll have to call it, and asked somebody to come consult with him. Well, the problem turned out to be rather simple. He had taken the magnesium strips, and he had put them on the inside of the hull. Well, if they're on the inside of the hull, they're sitting out here somewhere, and they have absolutely nothing to do with the circuit, and therefore they're not protected. So it's a fact the circuit. But this is how you protect ships. And in fact, if you go out and look at ships riding high, cargo vessels in, in Port of Oakland or San Francisco, very often you'll see strips of metal on the side of the ship, in, but what is normally below the waterline, and those are cathodic protections. Uh, the way that you protect, this turns out to be kind of impractical for things that are, it, it's good for ships because you do access the hull and they're repaired periodically anyway. It turns out to be kind of impractical for things like uh, pipelines, for example, because the pipelines are buried, and you could protect the pipelines with magnesium, but how do you know whether the, magne the magnesium is there or not, and you have to go dig them up and check periodically? So it becomes kind of a pain in the neck. So there's another way to do it. You can also use a battery. Remember that this is the cathode and this is the anode because the potential difference is there. Well, I can use a battery or an electrical circuit to reverse the sign of that potential difference. I can make my pipeline, for example, the cathode with respect to some convenient anode I have by just imposing a voltage. And that is the usual way that you protect underground pipelines from corrosion because you don't want to have to dig them up all the time. You have a wire coming up to the surface. Periodically, you have these little stations on the surface. The station keeps the, the pipe at a positive potential with respect to the things that might corrode it in the ground. And as a consequence, it is protected in that kind of cathodic protection. So we can protect with chemically, uh, with a sacrificial anode, or we can protect with an imposed voltage. And that's basically the way we do it. Now, what happened to automobiles? They don't rust away anymore. The thing that we started doing with automobiles is galvanizing. Well, you're all familiar with, pretty well familiar with galvanizing. If you go out and look at the bicycle racks on campus, for example, you notice that the surface of the bicycle racks are kind of dull and often have this large grain coating on them. And that's the same. It's, it's normal galvanizing. It's a hot dip galvanizing. And people learned how to galvanize the uh, steels that went into automobile bodies in some efficient way, so it was cost effective, and uh, protect them in that way. Well, how does galvanizing work? It's very simple. Let me take um, iron, and on the surface of the iron, let me put a zinc coating. There's blue up here, zinc. Zinc is, of course, anodic to the iron. So as long as the zinc coating is up here, nothing can get to the iron. If the iron is effectively painted, it's not going to corrode. But even if we rupture the zinc coating, as we did right here, here we have the zinc. The iron is cathodic to the zinc. So we now have a sacrificial anode, and the zinc will corrode instead of the iron corrode. So galvanizing is a very effective way to protect against corrosion. Uh, these days, an automobile, is, many of them are two-side electro-galvanized. Uh, some are one-side electro-galvanized. They also have very fancy and very effective paints these days. And as a consequence, even in the northeastern United States, the cars just don't rust away the way they used to. Of course, in California, they never did. Any of us who came from the northeast of California immediately thought we'd walk into an antique car museum because you'd have all these 10-year-old cars running around. And that just didn't happen in New England. They didn't exist at all. Uh, so this galvanizing is very effective. It's also rather expensive. The truth is, when you buy a car in California, you're paying a not insignificant amount of money that is useless to you. So someone in Massachusetts or New York can have their car not rust out in two or three years. You don't need it. They do. You have to pay for it anyway. Uh, OK, that's all I really want to say about corrosion. Let me quickly just say a word or two about interfaces. Uh, surface interactions, where um, uh, things interact with surfaces. And this is a huge area, of course, in, in engineering. The, the phenomena we worry about on, on, on surfaces are things like wetting. Um, you have coatings on frying pans, your car waxes to keep the rain off. You have detergents, which are supposed to uh, allow, make it easy for dirt to be removed, basically a surface process. Bonding involves interfaces, glues, solders. The fascinating issue of scotch tape, which I don't have time to talk about, but an interesting subject. Catalysis. Surface is the site of the most catalytic reactions, where things get together and combine for catalysis. Capillarity. There was a huge, long discussion back in the uh, 19th century about how on earth does a tree get water up to the top. If you've ever um, studied hydraulics, you know that you, can pump, you, you can't pump a well more than 32 feet up because that's basically the head. It pushes on the water. And even if you take a perfect vacuum, you can't pull water up more than 32 feet. That's as high as the atmosphere will push you. We have trees that are 100 feet high. How do they get the water up there? Well, the answer is capillarity. The, uh, you put a thin straw in water, and you see the meniscus come up. If the um, straw is thin enough, you can draw water up and up and up and up, and capillarity can get it to the top of the tree. It's a more complicated than that because you have various one-way valves in trees as well that keep it moving up. But this is, um, your blood vessels also use capillarity. And of course, all of this is governed by the thermodynamics of surfaces. Let me spend just a moment on surface tension and what it really is because uh, it's a very confusing thing. The thermodynamics of surfaces. Uh, today, we frankly know rather little about the true structure of most of the surfaces that are of interest to us. Surfaces between liquids and solids, surfaces between two solids. We can sometimes, the ones that we know least about, actually, are liquid-solid interfaces. A solid-solid surface you can section and examine to some detail. The liquid solid, unfortunately, the liquid tends to run away when you try to put it in the microscope, so they're very hard to look at. The thermodynamics of surfaces, however, was put together, the one we use now, by Willard Gibbs, in the latter part of the 19th century, before anyone had the foggiest idea what the actual structure of the surface would be. So how did he develop a theory of something we know nothing about? He did the following clever way. It's been applied in many other fields since then, but he was the inventor. Suppose I have phase alpha and phase beta in contact across the interface. And I say, what does the interface really look like? Well, the truth is I don't know. What I do know is that there's some thickness to it. There's going to be some region in here which is perturbed by the presence of these two phases. I also know if I get far enough away from that transition shell, if you want, then I have in the bulk phases and I understand their properties pretty well. So Gibbs says, here's what I'm going to do. First of all, this transition shell, whatever it is, it's an open system. That is, its temperature will be the temperature of the surroundings, and the chemical potentials of everything in it will be the chemical potentials of the surroundings, because things can move into and out of this transition shell really freely. So it's an open system. We know that the open system, the thermodynamic potential that governs the open system, is the omega function, the work function. The natural variables are
I don't know the value of this potential inside the, the uh, transition shell, but I know it has a value. So what I can do is do the following imaginary exercise. I can say, let me pretend that instead of being three-dimensional, this transition shell is two-dimensional. It is a surface. And let me draw that surface. And here I've got a dotted line. That's the dividing surface. Now let me imagine that these phases, alpha and beta, extend up to that dividing surface with no perturbation at all. They're homogeneous right up to that two-dimensional surface. I know that isn't true, but I'm going to pretend it anyway. Now I have an actual thermodynamic content of this whole system that I can measure. So what I'm going to do, since assuming that alpha and beta extend homogeneously up to the surface is wrong, when I compute my thermodynamic content on the basis of that assumption, I get a wrong answer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say all the thermodynamic content I have not accounted for, I'm going to assume resides on the surface itself. And that's what surface thermodynamics is all about. That's how we define material absorbed on the surface, chemistry. And in particular, that's how we, we, we define the mechanics. Because the value of the work function for this whole system is defined. I, if I assume alpha and beta extend homogeneously up to that surface, I know omega alpha and omega beta. The part I haven't accounted for is omega minus the sum of these two. And that, I'm going to say, is the uh, omega on the surface. And just like omega in the bulk is minus PV, I'm going to let omega on the surface be sigma A, where A is the area and sigma is the interface rotation. And it turns out that this sigma behaves just like a force, a two-dimensional force in the plane of this dividing surface. And thermodynamically, it just acts like a force. So this is the interfacial tension that we described and that we talked about. Um, wetting, an awful lot of the surface phenomena that we're concerned about basically get back to the issue of wetting. Suppose I have here a solid surface, and on that surface, I'm going to put a liquid. The liquid may be a film that I want to solidify and coat the surface. The liquid may be paint coming down here. The liquid may be water that I want to run off because I want the surface to repel water. It could be anything. But many problems in engineering devolve down to have a surface and a liquid on top of it, and I would like to know what happens to that liquid. Well, the configuration of that liquid can be found rather easily because it's going to be, take the shape of a spherical cap if it's in contact with a vapor because the pressure within it is going to be constant. And the spherical cap is going to terminate on the surface at a line of contact. And that contact will be characterized by what we call a contact angle. If we just go to the periphery right here and we blow it up and we do a force balance, we have a solid liquid tension pulling this way, a solid vapor tension pulling that way, a liquid vapor tension pulling at an angle theta off of the surface. That theta is what we call the contact angle. If I just do a force balance here, you can easily see that the cosine of that angle theta is sigma sd minus sigma sl or sigma lb. Now, the terms on the right-hand side of this equation, which is called the Young equation, can have any value at all. The left-hand side of the equation, however, is a cosine. So its values go from minus 1 to 1. It can't have any other value than that. When that cosine is equal to 1, the angle theta is equal to 0. When theta is equal to 0, that corresponds to wetting, because at that point, this, this, this surface just, just gets squashed out on, on the lambda surface. So any time the right-hand side of this equation is equal to or greater than 1, we have wetting, the liquid's going to spread out over the surface. When this equation is less than or equal to minus 1, I have the opposite condition. Theta is 180 degrees. It can't get any bigger than that. When theta gets to 180 degrees, basically I have a, a, a ball of liquid just sitting on the surface, not in contact at all. So that's the de-wetting condition. So theta equals 0 is wetting, theta equals pi is de-wetting. Uh, an awful lot of the problems that we have really deal with one of those two limits. If we want to paint a surface, we would like the paint to spread nicely, we want it to wet the surface. If we're trying to lay down a film by vapor deposition, we want the film to wet the surface. Alternatively, if we're designing a frying pan, we want it to repel water and egg albumin and such things. So there we would like the de-wetting condition to be obeyed. So let's look at that. Um, a simple way to look at it is that we will get full wetting spreading when, all right, if this liquid replaces the solid vapor interface, it replaces one interface with two. We go from an SD interface to an SL alpha beta interface. And that's going to be energetically favorable whenever the sum of the solid liquid and liquid vapor tensions is less than the solid vapor tension. When this condition is obeyed, we're going to get spread wetting on the surface. So how do we make that happen? Well, uh, one way to promote spreading or wetting is to raise the sigma SV. It's a con consequence of the second law that the interfacial tension always wants to be as low as it can possibly be. So if you want to raise it, what you do is you take the present state of the surface, which has a low sigma, and you try to get rid of it. If there is any dirt or contaminant on the surface, that dirt or contaminant must lower sigma or it wouldn't be there. So if I clean the surface, I'm raising sigma SV and make it easy for the surface to wet. And you're familiar with that. If you want to paint a surface, you clean it. If you want to solder a surface, you clean it. You're always doing things to clean the surface to promote wetting. This is basically why. Lower our sigma SL. Um, one of the ways you can really drop the li solid liquid tension is to include reactive species in the liquid, things that will react at that interface. Um, for example, oh, in microelectronics, um, many years ago, I was involved with a problem at IBM where they were desperately trying to uh, get various organic films to wet things like glass and other insulators that they were using, having a hell of a time doing it. Finally, came up with a very simple solution. I didn't have the idea, but it was obvious as soon as they came up with it. They salted these various organics with active chromium. Chromium forms a strong oxide. So you take something that had these chromium um, atoms, spread it out on an oxide surface, the chromium bonded to the oxygen, whoopee, sigma SL drops to low value, and you get your bonding. Sigma LB, uh, the uh, liquid vapor interface, you add some surfactant that just goes to that interface. Anything that goes to an interface lowers the tension. Put soap and water, you lower the tension of the liquid vapor interface. So here are ways that you can promote spreading. D-wetting uh, is preferred if it's thermodynamically preferable to have a film of vapor between the solid and liquid. So the solid and liquid don't want to contact one another. That will happen when sigma SL, the original sigma, is greater than the sum of sigma SB and sigma LB. Now there are very, very few things that just flat absolutely de-wet. One of the classic is if you have ever spilled a container of mercury, the mercury will form little balls and then scatter all over the floor. Mercury does not wet anything very effectively. It's not, not normal flooring materials and such things. Uh, when I was a kid, if you went to the dentist and you behaved yourself real nicely, didn't yell too loud when you drove your teeth, he'd give you a little bottle of mercury to take home and play with. They think it changed a lot in those days. <laughs> we have a lot of fun with the mercury. <laughs> uh, to promote de-wetting, of course, you want to lower sigma SV, add surfactants, or low sigma coating, a Teflon on frying pans, for example. You put a Teflon coating, Teflon has a very inert surface. It doesn't bond to anything very well because of all the flooring. And as a consequence, it gives you a relatively inert surface. You can uh, lower sigma LV by adding surfactant, raising a sigma SL, again, moving any, removing any possible surfactants or reactive species. And this is kind of, there's a, an awful lot of engineering out there. Uh, the, the country is full of chemical engineers in particular who make a living doing this kind of stuff all the time. 
looking for better surfactants, looking for things that are better frying pan coatings and so on. There's vast amounts. There are many, many high paying jobs in this particular area. And these are relatively simple principles, these things that you work with. Okay, that finishes what I've got to say about environmental interactions. Now we're going to turn to the electromagnetic properties of materials, and I'll leave that subject until, uh, until Wednesday. So, see you then. Here are the exams. And uh, I guess there's no real alternative.